welcome to Three Thinkers Podcast. I'm Kevin, along with my co-hosts, Erkan and Chad. And today we're talking to environmental environmental journalist and travel writer, Ocean Malandra. How's it going today, Ocean? Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Welcome. You know, we all took a lot of time to read some of your works and kind of delve into what you do and what your passions are as a journalist and a writer. And I, I, we, I wanted to start off by asking you about some of the urban agriculture that you've seen take place in a place like Bogota. And how is that changing the way uh, people eat? And how is that changing local communities there? Okay, yeah, good question, Kevin. Um, you, urban agriculture, um, is something that uh, I think has always been part of Latin American culture, actually. And even in the United States, I, I read somewhere that Albuquerque, New Mexico, had like the most urban agriculture of any city in the United States. And it had a lot to do with it, it that the fact that it's kind of like, it's a Latin city, basically. Do you know what I mean? Um, anyway, the, right now, of course, worldwide, uh, there's a big kind of uh, push, a uh, big movement to kind of... Um, to make cities more sustainable and to make food production more close to home. Uh, and that, that's something that touches on a bunch of different issues from poverty and, and food access, access to greening a city and, and climate change stuff. I mean, it's one of these kind of, it's kind of one of these, these movements that, that addresses a whole bunch of different topics. And I think it's really exciting. And there is, I don't know if I sent you guys this article. Last year, I did an article about uh, Bogota, about a system of there's already a bunch of urban farms in Bogota. Huertas, right? so huertas, right? Huertas, yeah, huertas yeah. urbanas, yeah. exactly, bro. Um, and so the, the botanical garden, along with a couple other kind of big institutions like the Museum of Bogota, um, got together and they they connected them all, and they're connecting them with seed banks, and they're creating certain ones that will be hubs for their neighborhood where other neighbor neighbors can come and get like supplies and knowledge and, and connections to build more. And so it's kind of like, boom, it's happening. It's kind of cool. I, I'm kind of curious about, you know, one thing I know about you is that when you, you are not a superficial traveler or expat. I mean, when you're in a location, you really like to get to know local people and the local happenings. And that's why, for example, if I'm going somewhere in Latin America that you've been, I mean, I hit you up. Hey, uh, I remember when I told you I was in Acapulco and you said, hey, go to Tasco, which is a, a, a Mexican uh, uh, Pueblo Magico, a magic small town. Um, but when you're putting together put, putting together together an article like the one you did for the Huertas, like what's your process? Like, how do you reach out to people in the community and, and, and what what things did you learn from them about the development of um urban agriculture? Because one thing I noticed in your piece is you talked about how there used to be, before the uh, colonization of, of uh, modern day Bogota, uh, there used to be a big forest of walnut trees. And so a lot of that old forest and, and, and nature went away. So uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what you learned from these communities? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great, uh, Kevin. And that's... Uh... You know, I have to I have to kind of go way back to that because I kind of grew up in a kind of uh, urban ecology movement. That's what it was called back in Berkeley and Oakland, San Francisco. My my mom was a city planner. Are you there? In terms of my process. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Chad. No, go oh, ahead. Oh go no, ahead. We, 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 we we lost you for a minute. We we, we oh. you froze for a second there, but you're back now. Okay. thankfully. I'm yeah. back. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, hip, I grew up with hippie parents, and so like <laughs> in that world, and so they were like, you know, dreamers maybe. Um, but uh, a lot of those dreams now are kind of coming true, and so that's kind of a lot of what motivates what I do. And I, I'm a travel writer, and like you said, I, I like to I like to make contact with the people. When did we meet, Kevin? Like, when was that? Twelve years ago. Twelve years ago, we met in Cali, Colombia. In Cali, Colombia, yeah. And you know, really, more than anything else, I was there because of the music, and it was like in the culture. Cali, as you know, it's not a beautiful city. A lot of people skip it or like 
stop overnight and they're like, mm, and they keep going. But to experience Cali, you have to kind of close your eyes and listen and, and, and taste the food and meet the people. And then, and then I think you like Cali just as much as I do. It's an amazing place, but it's kind of happening on a different level. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I know that, um, that Urkan, uh, you had some thoughts you wanted to share um, that uh, related to some of uh, uh, the agricultural pieces. So I'm going to yield the floor to my co-host. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, welcome, Ocean. Nice to have you on. And um, I was thinking about making a link. I was saying to the, to the guys before we, before we started, uh, making a link back to other episodes that we've, we've, we've you know, we've, we've covered the issue of farming and the future like agro futures and this kind of thing so i'm wondering what's your take on the future of the agricultural industry and how will that be reshaped will it need to be reshaped by force you know and uh, whatever and when i say by force i mean by necessity perhaps not just legislation or something but is there a natural is, it, is there a process going to be involved so i'm wondering what you think about those kinds of questions. Thank about you. Yeah, thank you. For that. And things like that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I watched that. I watched that podcast. It was really, uh, really fascinating for me because you guys, you guys had some really deep insights into it. I can tell it's something that all three of you guys think about and are probably kind of up on, um, which is really good because I try to stay, and it's something that's really hard to stay on top of. It's something that actually we're kind of, um, it, everything's happening so fast right now. There's definitely all kinds of different forces and movements and pushes and pulls. But if I was to simplify it, um, I would say there's definitely kind of a, a, a push for kind of a globalized, industrialized agricultural system that will be tech heavy and it'll be GMO heavy. And on the other side, there's kind of a, a, re, a push for a localized, regional, uh, more organic even and more diverse and, and, and locally controlled food system. And when I was living in Mexico City and um, met up with Kevin again, we hadn't met up in 12 years, I met up with Kevin in Mexico City. I was connected to a worldwide um, organization called A Growing Culture. And they're kind of an activist culture, but they have people in India and Africa and all over the places. Someone here in Colombia I'm supposed to hook up with. And they were referred to me by a mutual friend, a guy named John Rulick, who made that movie. I'm, you guys have probably seen it called Kiss the Ground. It was narrated by Woody Harrelson. It's about regenerative agriculture. Um, anyway, and I just learned a lot this last year in Mexico City about what's happening worldwide. Um, and it is a battle in some senses. It's also kind of, a, it's an educational process in some senses. And there's just a lot going on. And there's a lot of, uh, it, it we're kind of at a, a crucial, to, you know, literally like at a crux time right now, especially post pandemic, what is what what and I think for a while we're going to see hodgepodges of all kinds of different stuff. But if you ask me like in the future future what we're going to see. Um, I think we're going to see a more localized food system, but it's going to it's going to be a while until we get there. And that's every place, you know, regional. I think that's going to happen. That's, that's how we developed. Do you know what I mean? And from what I've seen, that's what's most more sustainable and more just. Do you, sorry, do, do you mind if I sort of hop in on this a little bit, Urkan? Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, that occurs to me is, do you think that the pandemic itself has sort of reset people's minds in some ways, reset the way they look at themselves and their place in the world or, or the way they look at the world itself and somehow has, has offered this opportunity to rethink things or, or is this something that's sort of long coming and now this is just that, that moment that that thing that lit the fuse, so to speak, or? Yeah, Chad, that's, uh, I think the pandemic definitely accelerated a process that was already in motion, but kind of both of them. There was also, you know, people are thinking about more about like resilience and, and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, the pandemic also was the biggest transfer of wealth in, in human history. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that went, there, there's a lot more corporate control than there was before as well. So we really kind of like both things kind of zoop, do you know what I mean? And that's why we're at this moment here. Um, and you see a place like Mexico and it's connected. It's connected to what's happening with inflation 
and uh, economies all over the world, right? Like um, Mexico, for example. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but the, but the, I sent Kevin something about this today. The peso is the Mexican peso is one of the few Latin American currencies that's not suffering as the dollar gets. It's actually riding with the dollar, and it's actually outperforming it slightly. I think only Mexico and Brazil are doing that. And from my perspective, from this perspective, one of the reasons why is the Mexican president five or six years ago invested in it. He, he kind of like kicked out Monsanto and he put in a GMO ban and he did this whole thing was called the seeds of the future. And he reinvested in ancestral food systems and the food in Mexico, Mexico City is like food in Mexico. I mean, it's always been great. It's always been abundant, you know. But it's you can see that it's part of their resilience, actually, in this globalized world. Something as simple as like the, the, the grandma on the corner with her blue corn quesadillas. It's, it's like it comes down to that in a way. Do you know what I mean? That they have that. Hmm. I, I want one, I want one theme. Sorry, sorry, Kevin. One no, theme. No, go I, ahead. Something I kind of sensed in your work. One theme that, that you uh, it seems like a recurrent theme is the way that uh, like like so things like local sustainability, local populations, they're kind of laying the groundwork, the, the framework, uh, the, the foundations uh, for the, a future that, that they're kind of anticipating, this kind of future that we're talking about, where there could be catastrophic um, impacts on things like the agricultural um, sector as an industry. And one, one of the themes I got from your work was that um, a lot of these local people that they're kind of laying the foundations with that kind of vision in mind, you know, is that, is that right? Do you think that's right? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's how, that's what I try to highlight places where that's happening. Cause I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a journalist, but I'm not, I'm not an unbiased journalist. Like we're supposed to be right. Uh, I don't think anybody really is, but I, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely want that. I, I see, I want to work towards that future as well. Uh, Kevin, I want to jump in real quick. You know, I, I think one thing you and I have seen in, when you're in an environment uh, in Latin culture is, I think maybe one of the reasons that these these local gardens take off is the the more communal sense of community in those environments. Or even you wrote a piece a long time ago about kind of informalized markets, right? And in, in Latin America, all, of, all across Latin America, you have informal mer mercados where people bring their, bring their, the things they've made or the food they've made, and they just sell it in the streets, whether it's on a blanket or whether it's on a table that they've brought from home. And I think sometimes a more informalized environment like that creates this, creates a, the, creates a, the, the setting for people to have those kind of community gardens, then if you have a, a society or a town or, or, or a place where people are more beholden to that big ag, big ag uh, food system. So, you know, because for example, when I was in uh, Puebla and you have families that make their own ice cream, I mean, it's not like, uh, it doesn't taste like the ice cream you get in a, you know, a gringo supermarket, but I, I think, from, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons you you see these movements in those communities, and I, I don't know if you would agree with that, or I don't know if you if you see that for your, yourself. Yeah, definitely. That there's a built-in resilience in that kind of uh, I don't know what you would even call that, but like it, it's an informal economy is what it is. Do you know what I mean? It's like people making their own stuff and kind of selling it where here and there, and you see it in Latin America everywhere. People set people's houses. Our businesses, like their front room is kind of a nail salon or like, like you said, they're making ice cream and those ice creams actually tend to be made with real fruit <laughs> and they're pretty bomb, you know? Um, and something you said right at the beginning of this last uh, question was about Latin culture. So like, you know, the community garden movement in the United States was born in New York City and it was actually like kind of hippie activist people copying what the Puerto Rican neighborhood was already doing. Because it was very natural for Latin people to kind of come into, to kind of start taking over common space. This is an important theme for me too, called the commons, right? And creating these gardens. And they function not just as a food production thing to have some kind of local uh, food access, but they also would have like, they would sit around at night and, and, and socialize. 
dance, you know, and play music and have birthday parties there and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, so I'm going to sort of bring in a, a, maybe a slightly different perspective on why people might choose to, to have these sorts of collectives. Um, so I, I don't want to say that I'm necessarily a prepper in the traditional sense. I don't know. Do you, do you all know that term prepper? No. No. Okay. So this, this is sort of a term so in, in case of a major emergency, like a major collapse okay. of society, um, a major, uh, it could be a flood, an earthquake, it could be nuclear war, you know, whatever it might be. So, you know, I, I have a little bit of that in me, maybe not as much as some people, but what I've seen is that there are some people who are, you know, maybe for different reasons, creating these sorts of intentional communities where they trade different things. It's like, uh, th this is the person who goes and catches fish and is really good at that. This is the person who grows herbs. And they're doing that as more of an underground thing, as opposed to, uh, you know, or they trade different skills. You know, I, you know, this person is a good plumber. This person's good at framing or whatever it might be. So I'm seeing more of that happen. Um, I don't know if that's happening nationwide or, or in, in other countries as much as well, but I'm seeing more of that kind of thing happen. So I'm wondering, do you, do you feel like either for that reason or for um, concerns or fears of corporate or government uh, influence that you might see more of that start to happen in the so-called West, in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, those kinds of places? Is that, do you think it has the potential to happen in other places as much as you've seen in Colombia or, or other parts of Latin America? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, man, absolutely. And uh, I was just back in the United States a couple months ago. Uh, I'm from Northern California. Um, I mean, a lot of it is just people realize that we are in crisis mode. California is, man. I, you guys did a podcast on homelessness. Homelessness is a big topic for me too. Um, but climate change, forest fires, just, just, just the cost of living. Um, the, California, and it's weird, right? Because California, also at the same time, it just came out that California is now like the world's, it passed up Germany to be the world's fourth strongest economy, right? So we, we have this system where you can be the richest or one of the richest places in the world, but you go there and it's like, yeah, this doesn't look like it's working. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? On, on all these different levels. And so we are in that crisis mode. And I think people are banding together. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's good. And I see it happening. I hear people talking about it everywhere, not necessarily everywhere. And I spend time in Las Vegas too, because my sister's an entertainer. And uh, I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> The casinos are still running. <laughs> sorry, yeah, Ocean, I think what's also interesting about what you just said about California being, so if it detached from the US, it would be the world's fourth largest economy. Um, and what's fascinating about that is that it has a water shortage as well. It's like, Absolutely. it has to, does it not have to import its own water, um, import its water or something like that from the surrounding land? And, and yet it still has this, am I right about that? Yeah, well, it gets true. most of its water actually like so because I'm from Northern California, Southern California gets most of its water from Northern California in a very, a lot of times unsustainable way. Yeah. 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 Well, also, um, there's a lot of water in relation to that that comes from the Colorado River system. And so one of the issues, Ercon, is that you have many states down there, Arizona, I think, Utah. And New Mexico, who all try to take from this river that's dwindling, and and at the same time, the population in Arizona and these Southwest states is exploding. So, you know, more golf courses, more uh, more almond 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 uh, plants uh, taking up all that water. So, the big issue now is like, how many you know, when will they have to start building more desalination plants? along the coast. So, um, but, but, uh, you know, I, I know that, um, what, what are some other, um, I wanted to actually, uh, give chat a chance to, uh, chime in because I know there was a, a piece of yours that really stuck out for him and I, I'm going to yield the floor and let my co-host Chad Bartlett, uh, take it from here. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, Ocean, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and pull this up right now. Hopefully I can find it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, there, here it is. There it is. So there's your piece. Everybody can see that, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is your piece. Uh, I think this is from a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2019, 2020, something like that. Yeah, I think it was about maybe 2020. Yeah. Okay. So for, for just in case there are people who are, who are listening and not watching, I'll just real quickly kind of describe what we're looking at here. This is a a piece from Reset Me, Reset.me, How Coca Leaf Will Transform the World by our, uh, our guest, Ocean. And, you know, there are a number of things that are interesting to me about this. Um, of course, you know, there are the stereotypes, there's sort of the, the Hollywood version of what, of what Coca is. Uh, I think, you know, the, the full on uh, Scarface, the, <laughs> with the, uh, the desk full of cocaine and all that sort of thing. Um, but, but of course, you know, a lot of people also know that this is a plant that has a very long history. I think you mentioned 8,000 years or something like that in the piece, um, has been used for, um, for, for energy, has been used for, um, I believe, elevation sickness. But I think you've, you also mentioned a number of other uses, maybe with um, both as a food and maybe as a cosmetic as well. Is that, is that correct? Um. I'm not sure about its cosmetic use, although okay. uh, there's there's actually a whole book about how it, it, it's the potent like weight loss thing, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's something I've written about. It's one of my favorite subjects, actually. And you put up this this is one of my more like you know obviously unbiased pieces here, <laughs> where I'm really kind of like I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward a certain kind of perspective. Um, but I've written about coca for Vice and for other outlets too. And uh, in this piece, particularly though, I'm kind of glad. I'm glad you brought this up. It's actually my favorite one of all the coca pieces because it ties into what we we're talking about earlier about how these kind of like local, sustainable, regional food thing. And one of the reasons why we don't have them is because a lot of the actual key components of them are just not being implemented. And coca is a great example. So this. Like right at the top, there's actually this little saying that I pulled right off the package, right? Which is actually talking about maybe our time right now, right? When there's a, there's not enough, that natural resources are being depleted, there's hunger and people are trying to figure out how we're gonna feed the world. And there's this, according to this, and it's an indigenous product that has this saying right on, I have a photo of it down below. People are like, did you make that up? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but see, you can take coca leaf the last real, real study done on coca leaf, and I get into this in this article, was way back in 1972. Dr. James Duke was a famous ethnobotanist at Harvard University, and he did a nutritional profile of it. And it has like the highest vegetable calcium source ever discovered, magnesium, all these things. And he said like a, a serving of this every day would be like 100% of the USDA requirements for all of these vitamins and minerals, not all of them, but a whole a whole bunch of them. vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and a bunch of minerals. And so in a way, this kind of prophecy thing is true. And so what people are doing here, my, my article for Vice is called How Coca Leaf Became Columbia's New Superfood. And I get more into the, the food uses, but you basically just grind the leaf down and turn it into a flour called harina in Spanish. And you can just add that to like white bread dough or, or cookie or whatever. It turns it green. It looks like something like a, a Popeye, you know, green food, like green eggs and ham, Dr. Seuss style. It just turns it green. But it goes from being kind of a nutrition calorie, high nutrition, low white flour product to like, boom, very high in nutrition. And you could probably, the money that we're spending trying to eradicate this plant <laughs> we could probably be like eradicating a lot of malnutrition in the world. And that's actually probably true. Do you know? It's one of those things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing too that it's only been in the last, what, five, six years that the idea of, let's say, decriminalizing uh, cocaine and by extension, the cocoa leaf um, is only happened recently. I mean, and I think one... Do you remember when uh, Evo Morales was became president of Bolivia, and he he would be chewing on the leaf, you know, the coca leaf, um, and that that you know caught people's attention. And I even saw recently the Economist, which is a conservative publication, wrote a piece or published a piece about why we should decriminalize, you know, cocaine. And it's it's interesting to me, uh, 
how often things get become illegal or stigmatized. And sometimes you don't even know why, right? Someone that's alive today might not know why or the roots uh, of, of why a certain drug or leaf are, de- are criminalized. And, and once you dig into the history, it's, you know, it's an ugly history. And, you know, it's based on, you know, a, a policy uh, that, you know, it's destroyed a lot of lives. So but this I is where, that, you know, Dan, we, we should remain in touch with kind of indigenous and traditional in, in some ways, we shouldn't just dispense with, um, you know, too quickly with, with traditional um, perspectives on these things, because these, these people, as, as Ocean mentions in, in so many of his articles, these people have lived with this plan for thousands of years, civilizations, you know, much older than ours. And so there's no reason to, to just um, demonize this, this plan. And as you say, spend millions, billions, whatever it is, on trying to eradicate this thing. Why don't we embrace its other properties? And maybe we can solve things like global starvation. And maybe we could use, use the plant in, for medicinal purposes. And, and I was saying to the guys just before we, you know, in the run-up to the podcast, like this is one of the things that makes chemistry so fascinating because the the, the, the point is that the different combinations of you know like chemical compounds can create completely different um, products in the real world. You know the underlying kind of chemicals. You know you can create. It's the same. It's the same kind of uh, ingredients that go into. Do you know what I mean? Like different. You can produce different products with the same chemicals it's just that's what's so fascinating about chemistry i think uh I, and do you have you personally um been able to like try some of this uh flour from a cocoa leaf and what does it you mean like, like in a in like a in like food you mean like yeah food? yeah yeah for example yeah yeah man there's a place yeah there's a place right in the kind of the candelaria is like the historic center of bogota where a lot of the 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 hostels are and a lot of tourism is and there's a shop there called the embajada de la coca and it's a cafe and he uh he's got all kinds of stuff you can try um he even makes like a fresh cake every day um people come in for a coca tea and a, and a, and a coca cake yeah if you come down i'll take you there man for sure <laughs> yeah you know what's interesting to me too is that <clears throat> this is where you know it's just a matter of time before this becomes commercialized in the west and you know, coca flour becomes the next superfood, and it's going to be sold in some package for twenty five dollars for you know ten ounces. So that's what's amazing to me is the the way things like that are viewed, right? And we've we've talked about this before, where you know, let's say you go to a farmer's market here in uh, Green in Greenlandia, and it's a expensive thing. It's a, you know, the stuff that you buy at the farmer's market in the States is expensive. Whereas if you go in Latin America, you go to a farmer's market, it's not, there's no yuppie element to it. It's just like you're buying direct from the farmer. And I just, I was just thinking about that as we were talking about the coca leaf and like when it does become commercialized and how like the people that are using it there for medicinal reasons or for, for food, I mean, it's just the commercial element it it doesn't seem to be there in the same in the same way so i don't know if you have some thoughts on that or not yeah it's uh i that piece you talked about about the markets that i did that, that, okay so that piece was actually you guys know the magazine reason magazine it's like a libertarian magazine that was com- is the only article in my life that i ever had commissioned and then they refused to print and it was and it, it was like the pitch was something like Let me show how the United States is not really a free market by examining like these simple market systems in Latin America, where we can see the law, the free market laws in effect. And then let's let's see if those are really in effect in the United States. It's kind of like what you were just talking about. Like, you know, we have farmers markets, but we don't really have these market systems like like where you and I had lunch. Right. A couple months ago in Mexico city, where there's this huge thing and there's just stalls and stalls everywhere and there's access all day long. And it's inexpensive, not just for the consumer, but it's inexpensive for somebody to have a small business too, right? Like where we ate was like this little family run uh, lunch place. 
they're poor, but they're not that poor. They had just come back from like a week in Cancun, the whole family, right? Like partying on the beach from running this little business in a market. And then so anyway, so I wrote this article for, for Reason Magazine. When I saw it though, they wouldn't publish it um, <laughs> because I was kind of like, yo, America is not a free market. <laughs> if you really look at it, you know what I mean? Because we don't have those kinds of opportunities. What we have is a kind of a, a rigged market where things are very much controlled by very large companies for the most part. And that kind of open access where there's all these little businesses going on and all this kind of stuff. You see a little bit of it, like you said, at a farmer's market, but that it's, and you said it perfectly, that's almost like a luxury thing though. Do you know what I mean? And that's where- And, you, and, and probably made too, worse by the pandemic. I'm sorry, yes. Ocean, probably made worse by the pandemic. You know, we saw a lot of the, we saw people getting that money, the PP, PPE, is that what it's called? Uh, we saw people getting that money, some of whom absolutely needed it and deserved it. But we also saw a lot of money flowing to a lot of big companies and a lot of wealthy individuals who absolutely did not need it. And, you know, and we had big companies still open while a lot of mom pops were shut down at the same time. So further, you know, taking away that, that uh, opportunity and that balance. Um, I want to kind of dovetail on something uh, Kevin was starting to get into a little bit there, which is, you know, the, the possibility and or likelihood that, you know, COCA will make its way to the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, other places at some point. So whether you think that is likely and if so, what the timeline might be, but also is there a way to do that in an ethical way that actually benefits people in the areas who have, you know, who have experience with coca for thousands of years, as opposed to it being a top-down kind of thing. So, what what are your thoughts there? Is it can it happen? If so, when? Is there an ethical way to do it? I love that question, Chad. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics. So, in that article <laughs> you put up, down near the end, I get into the fact that the fact that uh, Bolivia is betting on an export market and they're planting for an export market, right? Um, and I wanna use this to kind of go into like maybe something we, could, we can talk about too, one of the topics I wanted to kind of get into, which is what's happening in a, in a multipolarized world, right? So what's happening, Bolivia is definitely planning on exporting to the world. And also in the article, there's some organization, I think it's a transnational institute, it might even be the Open Society that advised Colombia to do the same. They said, Colombia, look, Instead of eradicating this, okay, so like we've got a couple, we've got a couple China, China kind of experts here, right? Kevin spent almost a decade in China, I believe, and I think Arkan, you you live in China now, right? And from what I understand, I have limited understanding of this, but there's a big interest in China for coca leaf. There's a big interest in China for a lot of different natural medicines, but coca, because of some of this, because of just the stuff that's coming up right now. Uh, is very interested in maybe importing it. And that would be uh, uh, something that would be like, eventually to answer your question, Chad, I could see it being as big or not bigger than like coffee from Colombia, you know, coca leaf from Colombia, why not? And why, and you know, it's mostly still grown in indigenous areas. The new Colombian president, it's only, who's only a couple months old, is probably going to legalize coca leaf and cocaine and completely end the war on drugs here. He's, he's been talking about that for years and um, it's probably gonna happen. There's already legislation that was prepared by an indigenous Senator from the coca growing region um, from the NASA nation um, that, that clearly outlines how that would happen. Um, and to answer the last part of your question about whether it will be, whether it will happen in kind of a just way. I think so. I think the indigenous people will, will still maintain a lot of control over it. Um, even coffee has kind of worked out to where people prefer to spend more money on like fair trade. You know what I mean? And Columbia developed this coffee association. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the history of that. Um, and with this new president, with what's happening in Bolivia, what's, what's, what's happening, this is where I want to go with this, in Latin America right now, which is kind of moving, it's kind of moving into its own. Brazil just elected Lula, right? Another left-wing president who even wants to implement uh, a uh, uh, Latin American currency called the sewer. Have you guys heard about this? Um, there's a real movement towards kind of sovereign, uh, breaking away from being overly dependent and controlled by, uh, you know, 
this globalized stuff and you know what's weird is like you got the right talking about global the globalized and the left used to talk about globalization and i don't really know what the difference is but i know that's all politicized but there's definitely like a, a global industrial uh network that does want to control what's going on everywhere including in your supermarket and what's going on in the in the in the fields here in Colombia, and so there's definitely a movement to break away from it. You know, and they're kicking out these big companies, and they're kind of reinvesting in this. And I think cocoa will be part of it, man. And I think it's potentially a huge and sustainable industry for all these Andean countries. Eric, um, I know, you, I know, you wanted to jump in. Did you have some thoughts? Um, well, I think the, the the conversation has moved forward from what I was really originally going to speak about, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I was just going to come back to, I mean, because uh, Ocean mentioned the term the commons, and I think that's, when, while we're talking about something like big capital and globalization, that's a really, and also these local economies and local markets, I think that's a really important point, the commons, because, you know, it's a term that Marxists use a lot, because what big capital does is it co-opts kind of ownership of pre-existing infrastructure, like the telephone, the phone lines, you know, uh, the rail networks, the roads. This is these these things belong to the commons. These are there's a lot of dead labor in that stuff. These these are the foundations that were laid down generations before by the working classes, the laborers. This is a Marxist kind of concept, and I think it's relevant. And um, that's what we mean by the commons as well. And big cap what. What big capital has a tendency to do is because it, because it is big capital, it just kind of co-opts. It, it claims kind of ownership of that pre-existing infrastructure and just piggybacks on the back of that dead labor, you know. And I wonder what you think. Uh, I wonder what you think about how um, will it be possible for these local to these local markets and local economies to sort of override that kind of uh, arrangement or what, what do you think? No, I, and I totally agree with you. I, I like the way you broke that down, Erkan. Um, it goes back to something Kevin said. Uh, there, it, see, in Latin America, there already is more of an understanding of common space is actually public space, meaning well, I actually have a right to it. And that's understood in Europe too, uh, more so than the United States. In the United States, a lot of people a, grow up in an area where there's not much common space. Do you know what I mean? Everything is very gated community and, and individualized and personal space. Freedom is your personal space. How big of a house can I buy? How much land can I own, right? Um, and uh, to tell you the truth, public use of commons is very restricted in the United States. You couldn't, like Kevin said, just throw out a table or a blanket in a, in a park in the United States and start selling things. I remember I grew up, I grew up in a, a very Mexican neighborhood in Oakland, California. And the ice cream that Kevin was talking about, these guys would come by ding, 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 and then have these homemade Michoacana ice cream, but they would get chased by the police. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they would get ch you know, chased by the police for selling ice cream. Now that's absurd in a place. In Mexico, that would be absurd. Um, but United States, I mean, remember why Eric Garner got choked out? for selling a single cigarette. I mean, that's when you're really poor, right? You buy a pack of cigarettes and then you sell them singly. That was that was his crime. That was what the police came to arrest him for. That's in on the sidewalk. Like you can't do that. Do you know what I mean? He's just trying to be he's trying to be an entrepreneur like anyone else. <laughs> like a big capitalist, you know. I think his crime, Erkan, I think his crime was he did it on public space. Like if he had rented, like if he had, you know, yeah, rented some private space and was selling single cigarettes. I would have been like, "Yeah, entrepreneur," but like, not on. By which space. time, <laughs> by which time he makes no money because the rent has swallowed up his profits. You know, that's uh, welcome to the you know that's the capitalist pyramid scheme. <laughs> the the overregulation and and again maybe why Reason Magazine didn't want to publish your your article, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's I, just go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, man, go ahead. I was just going to I published it myself on Medium anyway, and it got a bunch of good responses. So I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of want to, I want to segue to your travels through Colombia, because when I met you, I think that's when you started your journey as kind of a travel writer and um, as kind of a, you know, a, 
journalistic uh, wanderlust. And so I, I wanted to talk about your book uh, and, and, and uh, your article. Um, let's, let me bring up your book here real quick. So you are contra you, you have several books coming out with moon travel, right? Maybe you can tell us yep. a little bit about that and I can show the first cover. So moon travel, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with it, but they're one of the big um, kind of, lo you know, Lonely Planet is the most famous, right? Moon is um, kind of along a similar vein, yeah. except, yeah, what's really nice about them is they go with a single author. So like moon, Lonely Planet will have like five authors for a certain country and they all just compile a bunch of lists and it's great. Like if you want the best this and everything in a list form. I shouldn't say anything bad about Lonely Planet, they're, they're, they're competition. I'm also actually working with Lonely Planet right now and they're great. But Moon, I really, what I really like about Moon is they choose a single author and it's why I feel really like, wow, I was really, I felt really special. They chose me to kind of be the Columbia guy, you know? And so it's a four book series. There's the big book, which is all of Colombia, And then there's one that's about Cartagena and the Caribbean coast. There's one about Medellin and the coffee region. And then there's one that's just like a little city, city guide to Bogota. Now, only the first one has come out the pandemic kind of disrupted it. And I think the others will be coming out can, at the can end you see it? of, yeah. Can Thanks you see for posting. Right the, the others will be coming at the end of 2023. Another thing I like about Moon is they're very like socially conscious. Uh, they want as much like cultural, it's more like cultural travel, you know? Um, and so I had a lot of fun with it. I had a lot of, uh, and tried to include a lot of relevant social and historical stuff and, and indigenous stuff and, um, yeah, I, I'm happy with it. And um, it's cool. It's kind of solidified kind of my mm, Colombian authority. In it. I don't know. I don't know. It's cool, though. I'm really happy with it. And I'm looking forward to getting to work on the others. Now, I do have something. When is this going to go? There's something I can't talk about till after the 15th. Today is the 11th. When is this going to go live? Uh, this will go come out after the 15th. So OK, so I can talk about it. Yeah. So Lonely Planet, you know, they do this best of book every year. Right, right. So they chose Columbia's national park system as one of the top Ooh. attractions in the world. And I'm doing that whole piece on that with itineraries and all that, which is really cool too. Because you know, this is the most, this is the most biodiverse country in the world by square foot. Brazil is more biodiverse, but it's much bigger. If you kind of measured everything like by by the same sample size, mm -hmm. Colombia would be more would be the most biodiverse. And so the national park system here is like almost 60 different parks, I believe, of all kinds of different ecosystems. It's just an endless, amazing wonderland to explore. You, how many times have you been to Colombia, Kevin? You know, I went to Colombia 2010, 2011, and 2012. And the 2010 trip, uh, myself and a British guy I met in Peru, we went up some Amazonian tributaries from Yuri Maguas in Peru, and we ended up in Leticia, Leticia Colombia. Okay. Uh, next to Tabatinga, Brazil, and then across the, the tributary is uh, Santa uh, Santa Rosa, Peru. And yeah, I saw, I mean, I saw the first hand. We, you know, I started there and then I met a friend of mine in Bogota who went to my university and he pulled out his lonely planet and said, so do we go to um, Cali, Medellin, Medellin or uh, Cartagena first? And I was, and I, and I knew he loved salsa. And so I said, let's go to, let's go to Cali first. So, and that's where we met and related. I want to relay this, you know, the, the, yes, the, the amount, the amount of topography, the diversity of topography and uh, the amount of uh, parks is, is unbelievable in Colombia. And we met in Cali, which is known, you know, there's many different influences uh uh there's many different types of salsa and from what i understand i'm not a salsa expert I'm actually terrible at dancing but uh from what i understand and you might be able to elaborate on this is that the the uh colombian style of salsa is different than some of the others maybe you could elaborate on that okay sure man no i love i love salsa when you met me there i think i was just living there and then just salsa dancing and just like immersed in it me and farid right yeah, me and yeah. free were hanging out, and then uh, biscuit came. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so biscuit was way it was way deep into it. Biscuit is a guy from the UK, um, and it is the Cali is a particular style of salsa that came. Salsa actually was invented in New York City, right? It was invented by 
immigrants from Cuba and also other Latin American countries, what they call the salsa belt, Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Puerto Rico. It's kind of this belt right here in the Caribbean tropics. Um, and they got together in New York and they mixed mambo with this and that and they came up with salsa. And, and then it became a thing in Puerto Rico and it became a thing. All of those countries all had their big stars. What happened in Cali that made the dance very particular is that they took these LPs, these vinyls that were supposed to be played at 33 and they played them at 45 instead, right? So when you listen to Cuban salsa, it's kind of like that, it's a little bit more like that sun, sun stuff, like that Buena Vista social club, that, you know, it's, it's softer. Where Cali salsa is like, bah, 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 bah. it's because they actually were playing it at a higher speed and all that fancy footwork was developed from dancing to salsa at a higher speed. And then they started with their own salsa bands and they played at that speed. And Cali salsa is known for its like footwork. It almost looks like tap dancing sometimes. And it's really, um, it's really fun to get into. It's something that you just, you kind of, it kind of takes over your body. You know what I mean? When you get into it, it's really a beautiful thing. You know, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, one of your other articles. Uh, and I want to see if I have it. Um, I have it here. Um, let me, let me switch my screen here uh, to, I don't know how to do this. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me stop share for a minute. Um, and then I'll pull it up. Uh, see, share screen. Boom. There we go. So this one's called, um, you know, this one's called uh, a look inside, and this is on the Matador Network, right? Matadornetwork.com. So this one's in, an inside look uh, at Cartagena's Embassy of Salsa Music, a must visit for any music lover. So could you tell us about this bar that you said is on the top of a lot of lists? Um, called Donde Fidel. Yeah, yeah, man. Scroll down to, to Fidel. So okay. Donde just means where, right? So in Colombia and a lot of Latin America, uh, you have these places and they're just called Donde, where, and then the owner, right? It's like, and Donde Fidel is one of those places. It's just where Fidel is. And he's there every night, this guy. And he's this amazing guy. And uh, in this article, I, I talk with him a bit. I interview him. And, uh, you know, to kind of move in the opposite direction of what's so special about Cali Salsa, Let's talk about what he's about is what's so universal about it. And it is, it is also like this kind of universal. Salsa is very related to jazz. It's very related to like all of this music that kind of came from like the African diaspora in the Americas that blended European instruments with African rhythms and all kinds of different things that come up with something that moved the people. And uh, because Cartagena is so touristic and this location is right, have you been to Cartagena? It's like right in the, you walk into this old wall, it's an old walled Caribbean seaport. You walk right in uh, the main entrance under a clock tower and he's right there. And the place is like four, he's got like four spaces and they're all full. And then people dancing outside in the plaza every night of the week. And you'll meet like professional dancers, you'll meet salsa stars, you'll meet people from all over the world every night of the week there. And he feels like it's his, his mission to just kind of share that joy of what salsa is with the world. That's why it's the embassy of salsa. So yeah, I don't, all, my stuff isn't all serious, okay? <laughs> a lot of it's just, you know, what? But I think it's all connected, man, to tell you guys the truth. Like, kind of what Ercon was talking about, common spaces are best taken through joy in a way. Do you know what I mean? Um, and Brazilian carnival, for example, is, a, is a, like a, a great expression. Carnival in general, which originated in Europe, was kind of about that. It was about taking over the common spaces, showing that the people own the streets in a way. And that doesn't have to be burning stuff down. It can be joyful. You, you know, a great example of that is, is, is a typical night in certain neighborhoods in, um, in, let's say, Cali, for example. You know, people will just be out near their cars drinking and socializing with people they know or people they don't know. And it, like, that's something that I've always loved about a lot of Latin American uh, countries is it's very socially fluid environment where you can just meet someone and they'll be like, oh, you're cool. All right, you, whatever you speak, you speak some Spanish, come, come to our house and hang out or, hey, we're going to this, uh, we're going to this bar, tag along. And so, you know, we don't, 
if you know we don't come from an environment that's like that i mean you can't just go up to someone you know you're not just going to see some guy get in his car and you chat for a few minutes he's going to be like come on man hey come to my house let's uh let's hang out i got some beers uh huh do you mind if this guy comes with us yeah no problem okay uh so so that's something that's really great down there because it's so it is so easy to just flow with the moment in the street and meet people and um yeah so anyways uh that's all i had to say just what you said about the people owning the streets and, and the kind of the the socially fluid environment and that there's not some set plan or or some like set rules for how people have to act uh in terms of um what they do for the night it's sometimes just go with the moment so um what what are some places you know we just showed your book um first volume is about Cartagena in the Caribbean region of Colombia uh what are some hidden spots do you think people should should, should check out when they're in that part of Colombia uh in, in the Colombian in the uh Caribbean region yeah 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 that, okay they, so that they, that Caribbean yeah. region you know it, it's actually super I mean it looks small but it's actually I think it's longer than the California coastline just the the and it goes from like these dense jungles over by the Darien Gap where Colombia connects with Panama, which is an amazingly beautiful area. There's little villages that you kind of have to take a boat to get to. And then you're in these like jungle towns on the Caribbean. And at the other end, you have the Guajira, which is a desert. And um, that's an amazing place too, where uh, Colombia's largest indigenous ethnic group, the YU, which actually a matri matrilineal ethnic group live and that's an amazing area too. Cartagena of course is, is where a lot of the tourism comes and for a reason it's beautiful. But if people have more time, I always recommend either one of either one of those two extremes or both even because they're you know amazing culturally and naturally they're amazing places. Um and yeah that's that's why I asked you because you know like I said when I'm going somewhere and I know you've been there I mean I reach out I'm like I bet Ocean knows some hole in the wall restaurant or you know some hole in the wall jazz spot or something off the beaten path so uh are there other places let's say within Cartagena that really stand out to you I mean because you know there are the more like well-known places or the standard spots but is is there some are there some areas of Cartagena or some spots you think people should check out for sure man um so and Cartagena has a really interesting history so it it won its independence from Spain before the rest of the country, right? It had its own kind of like uh, revolution before before Colombia did. And uh, it, it even has its own flag for that reason. And one of the main reasons why that happened is because it had these kind of runaway slave communities. And the most famous one is called Palenque. And it's about an hour and a half outside of Cartagena. And it's been a free, it's like a free state for 500 years now. And a lot of the musical culture from Cartagena actually comes from that place. And you can go, you can go on like take a, a Sunday tour. I recommend going by tour because it's a little village and you don't really want it to be overrun. And there's certain tour operators that are, that are kind of locally connected that, uh, that can take you there. But if you want to see something really cultural, that's really cool. Um, and it's really deep, deep history. I mean, there's a lot of those kind of places in Brazil too, where you had these kind of like runaway slave communities um and some of them lasted for like hundreds of years and there were even like white people that were running away to go live there i was reading about especially in brazil because they were like it's actually more free there <laughs> so um mm -hmm. yeah so uh, Cartagena is interesting man it, it, it's touristy but it's interesting uh so chad do you have something you would like to chime in with well well so so I uh, Ocean, I hope I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I but I have to ask as a literature guy, as as a poetry okay. guy, I I have to ask, you know, do you, do you have much knowledge about the the literary scene in Colombia? I mean, as, as a guy up here in in North America, my my exposure is largely you know Gabo Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who's sort of like this huge larger than life figure from what I understand in Colombia and and in much of Latin America for that matter, but. Do you do you have a, a connection or do you know much about the literature 
uh, of, of that region? Or what is there something happening there that's sort of percolating to the surface within the literary scene that you know of? Or is that sort of a scene that you're not as familiar with? Oh, man, I'm so glad you asked. Um, I'm a, and it's cool. I, I read that you're a poetry teacher and a literature teacher. And it's like, you know, um, the journalism kind of pays the bills and, and I explore a lot of interesting things, but I'm a poet at heart, man. And I grew up, okay. I grew up in the beat poet scene in San Francisco, my parents, friends, and we're, we're on, in that movement. And that's like, uh, to me, kind of the heart of everything. And yeah, Colombia, of course, probably is home to the most famous Latin American writer, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is probably the most famous and his influence is, is everywhere. You know, and he's credited for inventing this kind of magic realism movement. Um, and it, currently, you're asking me about currently, Bogota, where I am now, is a very, very literary city. Um, there's bookstores on every corner. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of what San Francisco or New York were way back in the 80s and 90s when I was a kid and kind of bookstores everywhere. Um, and that wasn't the pandemic that killed that, right? That was more of the, the Barnes and Noble and then Amazon.com. You know, like it was like bam, bam. And, San Francisco and New York still have their independent bookstores, but it's not like it used to be. And here, in a way, it still is. And in terms of the liter literary scene, I would just say that people here are very well read. And I'm sure Kevin can back me up on this. Um, Colombians in general are very well read, and it's really a joy to talk to them. And they, a lot of my friends, I'm surprised about this, uh, the stuff that they, they that we, and, and Bogota especially. You know, Bogota was set up as the Athens of, of South America by Simon Bolivar when he kind of, he kind of had this plan for, and you know, Colombia used to be much bigger. It was Venezuela and Ecuador and Panama it was called Grand Colombia and Bogota was gonna be the center. And he was copying the ancient Greeks. He had this idea that Bogota would be like this Athens, this place of learning. And so there's like these libraries and cultural centers and it, it is very literary to answer your question, Chad. And if there's one writer I could recommend if anybody uh, is a guy named William Ospina, like current modern Colombian writer that I just, I can't get enough of. And we, we luckily he's prolific. A, we should include a link to that as well as Kiss the Ground. Yeah, in the, we'll, we'll okay. include a link. Okay, we, cool, thank you. The, the film you mentioned as well before, yeah, we, we will include links. But yeah, no, it's, it's one of my joy, the joys I have of living here, Chad, is when I have free time. There's a whole like book, there's like a book labyrinth section of the city, you know, with like walking streets and they're selling books all over the street. But then there's like these places you walk into and they're like five stories and different rooms and couches and you can just spend hours in there. I mean, you got, you, are you in Portland? You guys are in Portland, right? Portland still has Powell's. Powell's is, I actually worked at Powell's like 20 something years ago. Um, but Powell's is like probably the best in the United States. Uh, but there's still, there's some stuff like that here too. And it, it really, you know, coffee and a book on my, after, my free afternoons is still like, one of the biggest pleasures of living in Bogota really is. You're, you're, ma you're making me jealous. I was I was actually supposed to go to both Colombia and Argentina for part of my sabbatical and then the pandemic. So I'm, I'm jealous. I have to get down sometime and check it out. Thank you. Anytime, man, anytime. Yeah, I, I think Argentina has a very strong literary scene as well. Um, definitely. But uh, I was I'm really surprised. I was continually surprised by here how much people read. And you'll, if you come, you'll see that. You'll see books everywhere. It's pretty amazing. I just want to say real quick, you know, from the time I, when I was in Candelaria, Candelaria, there, that is, I think there's even a, isn't there like a Gabriel Garcia Marquez inspired library there or uh, like further, like close to the, to the government buildings. And then there are, uh, yeah. there are like, I saw on, in Candelaria in that main area, uh, there's, I mean, there's tons of bookstores, small, big, and there's also a university over there. So it's a very literary place. And um, I want to give uh, Urkan a chance to to chime in if he's got some closing thoughts or uh, questions he'd like to ask our guests. Yeah, yes. well, I, mean, I I do have a couple of closing questions. I, I one is I, Kevin's point about always consulting you as a kind of guru of like uh, South America. Um, <laughs> It made me think. Um, it made me think about something. Given the the spontaneity of these cultures and the changeability and the fluidity, is it something you, you have to remain mindful of that these places could suddenly disappear and then pop up somewhere else? D does that happen, or do you know what I mean? Is that something you have to be mindful of when you write your books? Like, 
do, do, do your descriptions of towns and villages, are, are they changeable within like a, a short space of time? So do you have to think about those kinds of questions? Or, or do these, or if, 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 we, if we visited one of these places, say five years after you'd written the book, would we still find it there? Or it just made me think, it just, it's just kind of fascinating because of the, you know, the spontaneity of these cultures. What, could you comment on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's actually a, a really good question because, for example, like in Cartagena, when I'm I'm recommending where to eat, I also recommend like street food, right? But the truth is, the chances of that same street person being in that same place two or three years later are you know pretty slim. Five years later, <laughs> because I mean they sell these amazing like kind of seafood uh, cocktails. They call it ceviche, but it's more like what we know as a cocktail. And you get like oysters and, and shrimp and, and octopus, whatever you want. And there's a whole row of them under this tree. And I do recommend this one particular guy because I like to, you know, I, 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 use, I call him by name and everything. But the truth is, he might not be there in a couple of years, but at that row of them under the tree will still be there. And you're still gonna have a good experience there. You might not meet Don, whoever, but you, you're still gonna have a good experience going to this kind of local place, sitting under the trees and eating a, a seafood kind of thing. But yeah, especially that's why we're kind of waiting for the next because post pandemic, we are officially in post pandemics over, right? But there's still a lot of flux in terms of what businesses are gonna be around. I see even just, I've been in Bogota for just a month now, there's a lot of new stuff and there's a lot of new stuff that also can tell it might not make it. There's like a lot of experimentation going on. Like we haven't quite, things haven't quite fully stabilized yet. So we're not going to, I think we're not going to, we're going to start working on the books next year and hopefully have those out by the end of next year. But that, yeah, that's a very good question about when you're, especially when you're trying to cover like street culture and street life and like trying to tell people to go somewhere and like, it's not going to be the same. Imagine being a bit of a head of that kind of revolving door situation. <laughs> Well, I wanted to chime in with that because I think that is a great point you make that maybe, you know, the the person that the the your go to guy for empanadas, empanadas, and maybe he's gone, but there are certain things that unless, you know, the culture suddenly changes that you will find. For example, I remember in, in Cali, the guy I was traveling with just loved you got people selling cups of mango, sla mango slices in Cali. And I think if memory serves, I think there's also arroz con leche, right? Like rice with milk. And maybe the same people won't be selling it, but I mean, you will see people selling those things, right? I mean, pretty consistently. So, but um, but yeah, so I, I, that's, that was just a thought I had that that was like a staple. I remember in the streets of Cali, there was just so many people selling like mango in a cup slices. And then I think sometimes they put stuff on it I mean, again, memory, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but um, do you, like, what do you think, my last question is, like, what sets your guide to Colombia? Like, when you look at other guides to Colombia, what do you think that like, sets yours apart from those? Do you think you have more of the on-the-ground perspective rather than the the kind of, like, superficial expat, rush through it, just kind of get a superficial feel for the local culture i mean like how do you think yours like when you look at other travel guides to Colombia, how does yours differ yeah i mean i think you said it <laughs> i don't want to say it <laughs> but yeah man i mean that's it, that's what i go for with it and that's the way it's not just what i go for but it's how i live here i mean you know me you know and it's like i do immerse myself in the local culture here and so that's what i'm sharing with people as a bridge, you know, you can get checklists everywhere. You know what I mean? Um, but if you, but I, I can take you deeper. I love the local food and I love what, even what's behind the food and the stories behind the food. And even to the point where how this food is, is it's the traditional food is more sustainable because of this and that. Like I, I go as deep as I can with it. And I try to share all that in that guy, in those, in my guides. And I think that's why they're different. That's how they would be different. Uh, yeah. And the I mean, music too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something, this is why definitely I, I was like, you know, Ocean would be a great guy to guy, guy to have on because uh, that's that's one thing that we both like is the, we like to, you know, like, for example, I was telling uh, Urkan that if you lived in Shanghai as an expat, Urkan's, uh, Ur Ocean's not living in the bougie neighborhood. He's living in the, like the working class neighborhood 
with the the local hole in the wall dumpling joint and so that's why i knew you'd come on with kind of a, a fresh perspective and and you give that real on the ground look um at the places you've been so uh do i was wondering if chad or Urkan, uh do you guys have any final thoughts I, 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 I would say I just I just want to thank Ocean for a great conversation and you know, we've, we've covered so many interesting topics and uh, just want to thank you for being gracious with your time and you know sharing all those documents ahead of time those pieces ahead of time, so we can really dive deep on them really appreciate it and appreciate your time and. Uh, Looking forward to reading more of your work and reading your books and hopefully getting down to Columbia at some point now that the pandemic is subsiding a bit. Thank you so much. I want to do the same. I want to say thanks. It's been fascinating. And I hope you can't hear there's some building kind of building work going on. I hope you I, I, We I can't hear it. Don't worry, we okay. can't hear it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I just wanted, I wanted to say the same. Uh, thanks a lot. It's been fascinating and congratulations on so many great pieces. And I um, I'm not sure quite what your objective is um if you have objectives uh, or you you know as a in your work but uh, if, if but um yeah great pieces thanks for coming on it's been a, a really great conversation thank you thanks a lot thanks ocean well i want to th i, I want to thank you both chat and Urkan. i've never met you guys before of course kevin uh, i've known for a long time i consider i consider you a good friend thanks for having me on the show but yeah, Chad, uh, both of you guys, come down. Um, always invited. Colombia is a very interesting place. And it's and I think it's going through its, it's going to have its moment too. Uh, with this, there's a lot of excitement around this new president. And at a lot at a lot of time, at the same time, a lot of people are kind of in a it's like in this this cr crux time again. Mm, the economy's kind of smashed, but the people are struggling. I came back just a month ago and I can see it and feel it. But there's a lot of hope at the same time. And there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of good things that can happen. Being the most biodiverse country in the world, it's also very culturally diverse. As Kevin will tell you, there's micro cultures within, you go from one region to the other, and there's more difference between regions than entire countries in Europe. You know, it's like, you have places that are like totally indigenous over here, totally Afro over here, totally like this over there. Woof, no, Kevin? So thanks for letting me come on, talk about all this with you guys. We did cover a lot in terms of what my objective is. It does all come together for me somewhere, Erkan. <laughs> Maybe I need like a three hour. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't mean that in, a, in an insulting way because it's just so, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to unpack and it's diverse, it's good stuff, yeah. Um, yeah so I wasn't yeah. sure if there was a particular thing, but yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> and maybe we should do a part two, you know? We oh, a, definitely. I think there's so much two. more we can, we can cover and actually, uh, you know, it's like, as uh, Ocean mentioned, I mean, I am thinking about a trip down to Columbia. So uh, anyways, uh, thanks again, Ocean. And uh, yeah, we'll have to organize a part two down the road. Awesome. Thanks so much, you guys. All right. Bye. Keith, bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone.